just let the last few people get their refreshments and get settled, and then we'll probably need to make a start. <coughs> positive element about these sessions is they're very tight in time so you can fit in in a very busy day. The downside is that we don't have a lot of time to um, you know, optimise the kind of discussion and getting on seats and everything. So, I'm going to make a start. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name is Leslie Giles. I'm one of the deputy directors at the UK Commission for Employment and Skills. And one of my areas of responsibility is to lead on the research and analytical programme that drives our work. And this activity really relates to that. Um, so when you have lots of positive things to say at the end, make sure you tell me and I'll put them in our impact log. Um, <laughs> So um, it's, it's for me to really kind of chair this session, try and make sure we keep to time, and um, to really um, maximise the opportunity to, to hear from our speakers today. Um, I wanted to start off by welcoming you formally to this session, and thank you for giving up your valuable time to come today. Um, this uh, session, the Masterclass, is one in a series of Masterclasses that we've run. Quick show of hands, anybody been to any of them before? Okay, so getting a sense of what they're about. For the people that haven't raised their hands, in a nutshell, really, what we're trying to use is old-fashioned techniques, really, in this digital age of sharing lots of information and being saturated with information. We're really trying to have timely uh, events, to really have timely and topical debates about some important issues. Why? Not just because we think that's really interesting, because, of course, it is, but really the broader outcome here is that we're trying to build the, brain, the, the sort of leading thinking and expertise together to stimulate conversations that hopefully will positively shape uh, policy debates and broader policy frameworks and uh, delivery and practice out there. Um, the heart of what we're really about here is skills and really trying to make sure that our skills system in its broadest sense works in the best way so that people that access different skills development, whether it's through schools, colleges, universities, private providers, or also, importantly, in business, really have valuable training and come out with valuable skills that make a difference to them so that they can progress through the uh, labour market and they can make a significant contribution. The topic we're talking about is helpfully there on the slide um, today, industrial clusters, learning and vet and future uh, challenges for labs. <coughs> Um, so really, uh, I guess the key things to, to emphasise about this today is that um, in the current climate we've seen, um, in this, as we're coming to the end of this life cycle of, of, of Parliament, um, we're see we've seen huge amounts of policy reform which have really been trying to make improvements to different parts of skills system. And in particular, there has been an emphasis on strengthening local action so really making sure we get right, not only national policy frameworks and national priorities, but the right kind of flexibility in terms of how those are delivered locally, so that that enables experts, local partners to work effectively together and hopefully sufficiently customise those national policies to effectively meet local needs. We've come out clearly, or, or well, maybe we could debate whether we've come out of it, but I'll start with, uh, Carol, continue where I started. We've co we're coming out of one of the worst recessions we've ever seen in history, deeper and longer than probably anything we've experienced. And in that kind of context, I think there's a real recognition that we really have got to get this local action right because we've got to be able to understand priorities at a local level and strengthen local economies. That's really, really key. And that's really at the heart of what this is all about. So basically, uh, I'm delighted to sort of hand over at this point to um, Dr. Laura James, who is now at the University of Stockholm, but was at um, the Centre uh, for Learning and Life Chances and Knowledge, uh, Economies and Societies, which incidentally, I should have said right at the beginning that the Commission is doing these masterclasses with that centre. Um, equally because you know these kind of issues are the, are the heart of our collective mission so really really important that we can share this expertise to push this forward so having said that I'll go back to them saying 
Um, we welcome um, Dr. Uh, Laura James, and you know we look forward to um, hearing um, what she has to say on this agenda, and also uh, Professor David Gahl, who um, is, has also uh, worked at the centre, uh, is more formally based at the Institute of Education, um, <coughs> University College London. And so I believe you were there, Laura, but you've now moved to uh, the University of Stockholm, but clearly there's this common agenda. So um, we look forward to hearing really how we're going to solve all the uh, problems at a local level. No challenge there. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so no challenge there, and over to you. All right, thank you very much, Lizzie. <coughs> Good morning, everybody, and thank you much for coming. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to just say about two things, and then um, Laura's going to start the presentation. Um, th these are just kind of framing issues, really. Firstly, um, Laura's an economic geographer. Uh, I come from the, the vocational education training background, and um, we developed a common interest in the theme that's actually up there, clusters, learning, and vet, uh, some years back when we, Laura was a member of Lakes. Um, we've continued our interest, even though Laura's gone to Stockholm, because we have an ESRC-funded network which is looking at uh, the issue of innovation with other colleagues across Europe. So we've drawn on ideas from the original paper, some of the other papers that were published subsequently. Um, the original one's right at the very end, and it's called this. I should did bring it when I stood up and I should leave it on the table. <coughs> and also some of the ideas that are coming from, from uh, out of our, our um, cross-European network. So on that note, Laura will take you through the presentation and I'll um, in this introduction, structure and everything, and I'll pick it up from there. There's a nice transition between the two contributions. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Sorry. Thank you very much, Rob. Well, just to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, um, we our starting point really for this paper and the presentation is the idea that uh, the notion of clusters and the, the literature around industrial clusters has been, but also continues to be, a very influential influence uh, on innovation and economic development policy in um, the UK and specifically in the context of this presentation which focuses on uh, LEPs uh, towards the end in England. Um, so I'm going to begin by um, kind of reminding us why clusters are important um, and, and how they um, are alleged to support economic uh, growth. Um, then I'm going to say a little bit about learning and the kind of learning that is implied by the cluster literature. Um, and, and then around this point, I'll be switching over to David, and um, he'll, he'll uh, uh, give you a bit more on, on how the conceptualization of learning in the cluster literature compares to the conceptualization of learning that we see, or that seems to underpin education and skills policy. What kind of questions and issues um, that raises, specifically in relation to economic development and vocational education and training policy? Um, and then towards the end, we'll say a bit more about implications for, uh, specifically for local um, enterprise partnerships um, and the local level. What's the wider context for this then? Well, um, here's a cartoon from 1870s from America, but hopefully you'll be able to fairly easily make some links with 21st century Britain. Um, as we just said, we've come out of a very serious um, recession we now seem to have a consensus politically that uh, we need to move away from things like financial speculation, fancy stocks and shares, um, something for nothing. We need to rebalance the economy towards uh, manufacturing, um, high technology um, and exports, though um, perhaps not uh, child labour. <laughs> so this is the way to grow rich then. How do we get there? What does uh, national policy have to say about this? Um, well, as you all know, of course, in, uh, in the last uh, five years, there have been very um, important changes in the governance of economic development policy. Um, we've had the uh, abolition of regional development agencies, and in their place, we have uh, local enterprise partnerships, which are um, much more locally led. Um, and they're now uh, responsible for um, developing strategic economic plans for their local areas, inclu including... Um, thinking about uh, vocational education and training needs. And so very much a focus on stimulating growth locally, um, a whole variety of policy initiatives, enterprise zones, growth deals, the new city deals, um, the regional growth fund that's been running for the last few years. So that's on the um, economic development side. Um, we look um, briefly at kind of innovation and um, research strategy, the, the um, most recent policy documents uh, identifies three key roles. Basic research, trying to improve the interface between higher education and business, for example through the Catapult Centres, um, and trying to deliver a, or 
create a better environment for commercialising research. So very much this link between um, basic academic research and trying to commercialise that in the private sector. Where do clusters fit into this? Um, well, it's interesting because clusters were, of course, um, I think quite central to what regional development agencies did. But if we look at um, policy documents from the last few years, we'll see that clusters are still there. People are still interested in clusters. Um, from that uh, innovation research strategy for growth, we see um, we need to remove obstacles that inhibit clusters from growing. Um, future manufacturing projects evidence paper from 2013. We need policies to nurture successful agglomerations or clusters, um, and they deserve a high priority. But as Nesta points out in a, a recent uh, policy blog, cluster policy is a bit of a paradox. Everyone likes clusters, um, but it's very hard to know actually, do, do our cluster policies work? Is it possible to create clusters and nurture them from scratch? Okay. Let's take a step back um, and remind ourselves what are clusters? Why are they important? Uh, Michael Porter's famous definition of clusters, geographic concentrations of interconnected companies, specialised suppliers, service providers, firms and related industries and associated institutions such as universities, standards agencies, trade associations. Um, writing a few years ago, um, Malbe and uh, Power gave these criteria for identifying clusters. Um, it's a spatial agglomeration of similar related economic activity. These activities and firms are linked by um, relations of, that could be collaborative but they could also be competitive. There should be some form of self-awareness among cluster participants they suggest and also some joint policy action. In, in that sense they kind of differ from Porter's um, um, view on clusters I think. They also say that clusters should be successful in some way. Um, they should be innovative, they should be competitive. So why are clusters important then? How, are they, uh, how do they support economic growth? Well, I mean, the first thing to, to note is that clusters are not new. Um, Alfred Marshall, writing in the late 19th century, um, um, identified clusters in um, Manchester, I think, as he was working. Uh, he noticed that firms that were um, clustered together in agglomerations benefited from um, economies of scale, um, skilled labour, specialised suppliers, shared infrastructure, institutional support, all these kinds of classic agglomeration economies, which um, <clears throat> made them a little bit more competitive than firms that were outside such agglomerations. Um, clusters kind of came back into fashion in the early 1980s. Um, with people writing about um, Italian industrial districts, um, but also um, in other places, notably <coughs> in um, America. Uh, people like Alan Scott, who wrote about the garment industry in Los Angeles. What he noticed was vertical disintegration in certain industries um, and outsourcing. So he, he was studying small garment firms where they would outsource various parts of the production um, to other small firms. And the benefit of clustering together was that reduced transactions costs, not only in terms of just moving the goods between the different um, firms, but also in terms of um, trust and in culture. You knew, you knew where to go to, who could do a job quickly and be trusted. Um, the cluster literature kind of went through an institutional turn, I suppose, in the early um, 1990s. Um, and people like Michael Storper, um, Ashamin, Nigel Thrift started talking about the benefits of the culture and the institutions that seemed to develop in successful clusters. And said it was this kind of institutional thickness that helped to support growth. Um, and then we come to the focus of our presentation, localised learning. Um, and, and really from, um, I suppose, early, mid-1990s, people really started talking about um, learning and knowledge dynamics in clusters as being the, one of the key reasons for them being so successful. Um, this is the idea that knowledge in certain ways is sticky, that various kinds of knowledge were developed in a cluster, um, and various kinds of localised learning processes took place that were very difficult for firms outside the cluster to access. Um, I think the argument is summarised quite nicely by um, Ashleim and Isaacson, um, writing in the early 2000s. He said that the crux of the argument about clusters of learning is that proximity between different actors makes it possible for them to create, acquire, accumulate, use knowledge a little faster than firms outside. Um, and much of the capability that's found in these kinds of clusters 
is rooted in inter-firm networking, interpersonal connections, local learning processes, and sticky knowledge. Okay, so a whole bundle of, of things there. Let's look a bit more closely at the kinds of learning processes that are said to happen in, in clusters and the characteristics. I think the first thing to um, emphasise is <clears throat> when we talk about learning in clusters, the literature is really talking about learning as innovation. We're talking about firms learning how to produce new and improved <coughs> products. Okay? We're not talking about learning as going to school or going to college necessarily, something like that. I think the second key characteristic is that this learning um, takes place through participation. Okay? Participation in the economy of the cluster. Um, Malbec and Power quite helpfully kind of separate the different processes by which that might happen. Firms monitor their rivals, they see what their rivals are doing and copy them if they're doing something better, for example. They interact with their clients and with their suppliers and learn how to uh, produce goods and services better. There's mobility between firms, employees carry knowledge with them as they uh, change jobs. Um, and they also exchange knowledge um, uh, on a social level the classic going to the bar after the conference and, and so on. Okay. Because learning in clusters is based on this kind of interaction, it's seen as collective learning. So it's not just individuals who learn or firms who learn, but um, in the, within the cluster literature there's a sense that clusters themselves learn, in a sense. Um, because of the kind of routines and institutions that build up around particular technologies or particular industries in a cluster, um, firms learn to do things in a certain way, they tend to do things in a similar way. Um, and therefore, um, what's known as tacit knowledge builds up around particular activities in the cluster that's very hard to reproduce elsewhere. This also means path dependence. The, the cluster tends to follow a learning trajectory. Okay. Um, that could be a positive development, but of course we all could point to examples of clusters that have declined over time. With, um, as path dependence has got locked in. So I think I've come to the end of my presentation here, David. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave, leaving the kind of the, the mechanisms of learning in clusters, I'll now hand you over to David, who will perhaps raise some of the issues of problems and tensions within <coughs> that uh, literature. Okay, wait, well, thanks so much, Laura. <coughs> Right, okay. Um, so to pick up on that note where we've just um, managed to transition, uh, I want to start with asking some questions, raising, or raising some questions and issues about the cluster literature. And um, this is going to, in comparison with what Laura's just said, but this first part is going to be a little bit kind of more abstract, because what Laura's contribution is very much grounded in the literature. These are, we're extrapolating out of the literature to raise these issues, then we will hook it back into the literature, the vet literature in a moment. So first of all, as Laura has said, and I'm just therefore I'm just going to skim over the first two bullet points. But the link between uh, the cluster literature identifies the link between the interactions she just mentioned and the outcome for this economic growth, and it uses a term increasingly participation to refer to processes which facilitate those outcomes. But it does it in a particular kind of way, and it's rather black boxed. It often uses this phrase when talking about clusters or firms in clusters absorptive capacity which doesn't help us at all understand what's actually going on, other than something has occurred. So by doing that, what they miss is that participation actually means two really important and often conflated issues. The first one is the development of capability at both the individual and the firm level. So it's as much as an individual coming into a VET program to develop expertise, and the firm itself knowing in its specialised area how to use that capability to move forward, but also using the capability to support knowledge transfer and to overcome the stickiness issue that Laura was referring to a moment ago. And of course, in any company or any firm, those two things are going to fuse together. <coughs> Quick sort of aside, having gone to the Centre Skills presentation a couple of weeks ago, when you watch some of Jaguar Land Rover or companies like that presenting, you can see that they have that completely. They've got those two issues and they're integrated, but that's not true in all areas of all companies. <coughs> now, let's step back then, or perhaps parallel, to look at skills policy. <coughs> and, um, and we're looking at it from kind of 2010 onwards <coughs> in relation to the assumptions that actually often underpin skills policy. And in doing this, it's not a critique, it's a positioning. So you'll see in a moment with a table when we bring the two 
notions of learning together, how they may well have a complementary relationship, but actually, if you don't understand their difference to begin with, you miss the way that they can reinforce one another. So, what tends to happen through funded programs, apprenticeship, etc., is we look at the individual acquisition of existing knowledge. We look at whether the apprentice has got it or not. Okay? Knowledge then is defined as having a clearly measurable content, and it's about the input, what we put into the curriculum, or what the awarding body is specified as that the, 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 the stuff that should be covered, rather than the processes in the vet institutions that are going to actually assist people to <coughs> engage with that, let alone the processes in the company that are going to assist people to use the knowledge that they've actually acquired. Another assumption that's, in, <coughs> that's picked up, really, is that knowledge that's learnt through qualifications is easily transferable. But as Laura has already indicated, we can actually see that the knowledge in, through the cluster literature shows it sticks. It's not always that easy to transfer. So we've got a little bit of tension there between the two <coughs> perspectives. And second, and lastly, that learning is discontinuous. It occurs at specific times and places, and then people apply it, which is very much like an educational, not just a vet, but a broad educational conception of learning. Whereas, of course, as we can see from the cluster presentation that Laura gave, the learning is ongoing all the time. So, what I've done to try to take us to the table in a minute or two is actually lift out two terms that appeared in both Laura's initial slide and then in mine, the terms acquisition and participation. Acquisition referring to the, what you might refer to as the skills policy, conception of learning, and participation to the conception of learning that exists, <coughs> even with some reservations about how it exists in, in the cluster literature. So there's a little bit, a bit of a divide between economic development and innovation policies, which put the focus on collective learning and business development, and education and skills policies, with their focus on the actual opposite of that, individual learning. So of course the challenge becomes, how do you bring them together? It's not just having the separate tr and parallel tracks, they need to be fused in some kind of way. So <coughs> what happens is that, because of this divide, some questions have been raised. And I want to just refer, first of all, to our own work with Lauren Unwin, who isn't here today because it's a presentation from Laura and I, but was very much a part of this work <coughs> when Laura was uh, with us in, in the, um, um, the, the Lake Centre. It was also part of the Kill Network. So the kind of questions we actually asked in our paper, which was the, uh, the, the kind of the root of this presentation, was is the acquisition of, sorry, whether is the acquisition of qualifications equals learning at the end of individual level or not, or is it just the certification of having gained something? Because can you automatically assume that what's being learned through a qualification <coughs> is actually going to be usable in the workplace? Secondly, does that necessarily provide the basis for collective learning? Because one of the issues that we picked up from looking at the clusters we were <coughs> discussing when we were in Birmingham in the West Midlands, that was the area where Laura and I did field work for a lot of this, was that all too often you couldn't see the, the relationship between the individual and the collective. Well, then another important issue that's been raised by some colleagues of ours, not just at the Institute, but also more broadly, globally, is the part that skills ecologies play in facilitating skill development. Now, the skill ecologies are kind of like a, a, an educational version of the clustering argument. It's about the bringing together of the educational institutions, not just the, the, both the, the policy as much as actually the delivery institutions, with the economic uh, 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 participants and actors, so that we actually have a meshing of both what we're referring to as the individual and the cluster. So we thought it might be helpful to actually present this to you in the following way and say, what, if we compared the learning between the skills policy and cluster literature, what kind of imp impressions and messages come out? And so I'm not going to go through every one of these. I'm just going to point to the framing. We've got the conventional skills policy in the clusters. And we have our categories over on the far left-hand side. I'm just going to pick out a couple so that you can see the differences. And then having done that, take you into the implications <coughs> in a minute or two for LEPs, uh, <coughs> who are actually, in a sense, positioned, whether they thought they were or not, to actually deal with what we call this divide. Okay? <coughs> so <coughs> one of the issues I'd like to pick up is about the outcome of learning. From the skills policy side, it looks as qualifications. And I'm not suggesting for a moment, by the way, you only think I'm suggesting that this is, a, this is not appropriate. Of course it is. But that's not what's coming from the clusters. It's about innovation, ways of working, and new products and services. So there's an interesting question about what's the articulation between those two outcomes of learning. So to get to that, we have to look at the processes. So if we then look at the learning trajectory, it's individual and discontinuous as opposed to collective and cumulative. 
There's a really interesting study for, <coughs> that illustrates this from the Netherlands on apprenticeship, which actually shows how the learning of apprentice <coughs> um, laboratory technicians occurs all the time through the work experience by collectively working with everybody in the laboratory as opposed to when they were back in school or college, just the same as in the UK, where actually they work quite individual, in an individual way in their laboratory. <coughs> so you'd see the point that you have to sometimes tease out the fact that there are different notions of learning and they can position people to think and, to, and then to act quite differently. What kinds of knowledge? Well, very much in schools, with educational system, disciplinary knowledge, here, sectoral and sometimes disciplinary as well, but it's contextualised in a regional economy. I want to come back to that point in a moment. Sorry, did you want to ask Can a question? Can I just ask, are the slides going to be available? Yeah, they are. They are indeed. Yeah, 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 sure. No, absolutely. Okay. And something also that Laura, Laura raised earlier, the point about a lot of the knowledge is tacit. Now, can we just be clear, when we say tacit, we don't mean how it's often used in a common sense way as, hey, David, what's the best way to get to Victoria Station? Because that's a tacit knowledge we pick up from living in London. What we mean is the tacit knowledge associated with occupational specialisation. How do you do this or that bit of work? So there's a different twist to the tacitness. <clears throat> so the policy aims, we clearly still want to increase qualification levels and want to improve employability. But we've also got another set of policy aims, individuals and work teams to become effective participants in new modes of working and firms to be effective participants in clusters. So, so let's move forward from there. <clears throat> What's the challenge? And I'm going to invoke our good friend Ewart Keep here just to set the scene. The Coalition <coughs> will focus UK skills policy, and most of you in this room are very familiar with this, I'm sure you its argument, so there's a greater role for employers. The implications, though, this is from Ewart, okay, I think, don't think he's necessarily completely wrong here, but some of the meta-level policy goals are more limited. If you stop setting as a government national targets and stop specifying this to happen, whether you may see that as a, the right thing to do, but it weakens, to some extent, the scope for government to intervene. They can set frames, but how they're going to actually direct at the local level is much harder to actually see. Therefore, another traditional policy move through the cuts to the budget is that the classic way of let's generate loads and loads of new initiatives to try to actually trigger a change, the government can't do that because there's less money. It's not saying that they won't do some initiatives, but there's a lot less money, so it's a lot more restricted in terms of what we can do. <coughs> And the policy agenda is much more mixed. It's about central and local, where Laura started talking about <coughs> the, <coughs> the, the, the strategic economic plans that the left have to produce. So there is an interplay between the, what you like, the bottom up and the top down, about how they come together. Okay. So <coughs> what is, then, the challenge for LEPs? But it's not just LEPs, because, of course, the LEPs consist of people who are from the employer, the colleges, the providers, local community. The argument that Ewart makes, and we want to use to lead us into what will be only about a couple more slides so that will give you time for some questions, is that if you're going to achieve this feedback from the local level through the economic plans, somebody has to be out there, whether it's an individual or more than one individual, actually animating, bringing people together so that economic needs, emerging ones are identified, long-standing ones that need to be enriched and strengthened are identified, VET needs are identified <coughs> and they're brought together in a cohesive, coherent way. So the question is, if there are animators in place, you can build on them. If there aren't animators in place, then they have to be put in place. Because what they're doing, if they're going to support the drift of our argument about the importance of clusters, they're trying to support collective learning. And it's the collective learning issue that actually supports the clusters to move forward and prosper. Now, <coughs> I'm going to do two things <coughs> here. Um, <coughs> I'm going to paint a picture of a way forward. This is speculative, but not speculative that it's disconnected from the policy context that we're currently operating in. And I'm going to suggest to conclude where we might ground our speculations, uh, potentially, to actually pursue some of the issues that Laura and I draw to your attention. <coughs> so first issue is, Assuming animation processes are in place, what LEPs can do is they can include support for collective learning. But here it might not always be full qualifications because the feedback consistently, not just when Laura and I talk to companies, but what you hear when you talk to companies, is they don't always need full qualifications for people who are at the work who have skills. Sometimes they need part qualifications or even support that it's VET support that doesn't necessarily relate to a qualification framework. But they also need support with knowledge transfer. 
And that needs to be built into the strategic economic plans. So if you've got local animateurs, and I'm going to point you in the direction of a part of the UK at the moment I think that does have, then they can build upon what's in place. But there's another challenge that comes out of Laura's earlier presentation. <coughs> it's much more difficult if you don't have local animateurs. So the support for collaborative learning assisting firms in clusters to innovate by, sorry, I've <coughs> lost, got dry throat and I lost my line there. Let me just quickly backtrack, sorry. <coughs> so um, support for collective learning to assist firms in clusters to innovate uh, actually allows them to diversify those path dependencies and to develop new combinations of the different forms of knowledge that Laura was identifying earlier that are critical to whether a cluster is successful <coughs> and, and thrives and prospers. The more difficult challenge, okay, for a LEP is to create new clusters and new synergies between clusters because that's actually where the real hard work has to be done. Now, to do so, LEPs have to think quite hard about how they create conditions to stimulate firms to participate in clusters because although there's been this rich history and we can look at it globally as much as in our own country for where clusters exist, there's also a lot of resistance where companies are often prepared to say, we don't see a benefit. We actually fear we may go out of business by associating with either a rival in the same industry or a potential competitor in a, in, in a related industry. <coughs> but economic development increasingly is actually about looking at rela things relationally rather than with a zero sum conception of, <coughs> um, of economic activity. So our suggestions are these, some strategies to stimulate innovation. And these are very low cost, quite deliberately. One, fund via growth deals, network meetings to identify new clusters. So to trigger off the discussion of, at the local level, it's consistent with LEP policy, the new rounds of discussions between people. Then LEPs to prioritize the outcomes from the new, those meetings, in other words, the ones that they think in the locality are the strongest ones, or the ones most likely to have some kind of return. Thirdly, then in the next round of growth deals, pilot, pilot some activity to stimulate innovations in clusters. So we've gone with a gradualistic process of building it up slowly, not jumping in saying, hey, you need a big new initiative, we need a great big budget, but rather going with the grain of policy and thinking in an economical way about how to achieve the goal. Now, before anybody says to me, is this possible, how about this? A potential starting point, Manchester. Why? Well, you could say it's the northern powerhouse. But there's another reason, for those of you, and there's one person in the room knows Manchester really well, okay, <coughs> the Commission for the New Economy, which has been in Manchester for some time. What the Commission for the New Economy has been doing is this, <coughs> producing policy, strategy, and research to encourage collective thinking about that economy. Therefore, it has the infrastructure to encourage the creation of new clusters. One way, if anybody wants to test out what we're suggesting, is we could turn to somewhere like that in the UK and say, very economically, with the grain of what they're doing already, how are you diversifying? And everything about the Northern Powerhouse argument is about the diversification of industries <coughs> to innovate to create new, new uh, areas and pockets of employment and also to kind of create new products and services. So on that note, I'll stop and take questions with Laura. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Laura and David. So at that point, there's the challenge. Who wants to take it? Sandra. Could you say who you are as well? I'm Um, it was launched yesterday. yesterday. Launched yesterday. Yes. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to know what, what are the sorts of market failures that prevent firms from doing this anyway themselves in clusters? Why, why does there have to be government intervention rather than we? Um, I think historically one of the main reasons is this path dependence that we see in the way that firms operate. They tend to look for new solutions close to what they've already been doing. Um, and we end up with, can end up with a downward spiral where institutions and routines become um, solidified, if you will, around a particular way of doing things. And it can be very hard for firms to break out of that. And so I think that's one of the, historically one of the main failures of clusters and why they might need some kind of external help to be able to see new paths or 
plasticities within existing parts. So are the successful clusters that you've identified uh, were they stimulated by some government intervention? And if so, what, what, they were, what were they stimulated by? Um, well, that's one of the big questions. What, what's the role of government policy in creating clusters? And usually the examples that we find in cluster literature are not necessarily ones that have been stimulated directly by... Except Silicon Valley. Except I was about to say, oh, sorry. Big exception yeah. Silicon Valley. Without American investment in, in basically the, 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 the military spend, Silicon Valley, would, the conditions for Silicon Valley would not exist. The, 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 the David Feingold and other studies are, are actually on clusters and, and ecologies kind of reveals that very clearly. Okay. But remember, in, in a lot of the European countries, it's taken as axiomatic that governments would put money. So it's actually part of their policy agenda. So it doesn't appear to be something that's being argued for. So if we take Finland, where there's also arguments about the development of clusters, Manuel Castells wrote a book about cluster development in, in Finland. You can see that it was actually, it didn't have to be presented like that. It was presented actually as, this is how we're going to change the economic conditions. It was a different, so often the cluster emerges um, buried in another kind of argument. Okay, we've got a few questions. Maybe we'll take a few, and then I'll use sure. I'm Doug Neddy from uh, New Skills team in this. Um, a, a quick point um, and a, a question. So, a quick point is um, I wouldn't see qualifications and outcome. I don't think that this does. I think they see it as an output. You know, knowledge and skills is the outcome. And I think that more and more through apprenticeships and traineeships, people are learning on the job from their colleagues and reflecting on that learning rather than just in a classroom. So, that's, so that's my observation. Um, my question is. Have you looked at group training associations and their history as a history of clusters mm -hmm. drawn from probably a government policy of having industrial training levy from the 50s onwards, which have largely died away um, you know, with the GTAs? Okay. So okay. All right, sorry, yes. I'm going to take a couple more. So one here and. Um, you are taking GTA. Hi, my name's Kathy Ellis. I'm a director of Hybrid College Portsmouth, which is a large vocational education provider and there's interesting further education was sort of not mentioned in any of the slides of the celebration on HE. My role there is Director of Inquiry and Emerging Practice and I combine that with a PhD I'm doing looking at the, the role of technology in developing the, the capacity around collective learning, collaborative learning, very much in the Manuel Castell self-programmable -pro learners. So my, my point is really stre it's stressing what the, the, the role for developing, I mean, I totally agree with the point that you made, which is that gap in how do, de how do we develop in our learners, in our colleges, uh, probably further down the schools, but in our colleges, when they enter the labour market, that they actually have the capacity. I've been running field work in the UK, India, and the Caribbean, with, and, and the results are coming out later on this year. And, it, and, and we make all sorts of assumptions about young people's ability to operate in that world. So I think that's a really important point that we really do need to press home. Otherwise, we'll, we'll start constantly with that relearning agenda that you know, we often have to do. Okay. Um, Andrew Patterson, local growth analysis here in this. I, um, I had two questions really. The first one is um, about evidence really and, and, and evidence that some of this stuff actually works. And if you've got some good e examples yeah. of where collective learning has worked and, and you know, demonstrably improved the success of a, a cluster. Um, and the second one is really about sort of with, with specialization, particularly in clusters, often what you find is um, increased vulnerability as well because you get dependence upon the single sector, you get to a certain extent perhaps. Um, Group think where people are trying the same ideas, which may not be the right ideas. In finance, of course, we've got obvious examples of, of that. Um, and you know, some real risk of skills and technology obsolescence as well that goes with you know, that kind of specialism. So, just wondering if you could. You want to take that? Yeah. 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 So, something then on qualifications <laughs> that are there. Yeah. Yeah. Something about yeah. the role um, for FE colleges in collaborative learning and whether we've got actually robust so, evidence about what works behind the yeah. Well, I think one thing we didn't go into in the presentation today of time is that the cluster literature has moved on, and this issue of path dependency. I think comes back to the first question as well. Path dependency and becoming over-specialised is very important now. And I think David brought up kind of two issues. It's about this um, individual and collective learning within clusters, but also how can clusters learn 
to, to move on and to diversify. I think that's one area where the literature is quite helpful. Um, we mentioned Finland. Um, I don't know if you're aware of Lisa Palmer Corpy's work on regional development platforms and related variety. So it's the idea that we need to, okay, we've got a specialisation here, but what's related to that? What's close to that? How can we um, perhaps not start a brand new path, but how can we have path plasticity? Um, so I'm kind of forgetting where the question mark came in your comment, but uh, I think that the cluster literature is moving on and it, it, it really speaks to this issue that we have of how do clusters learn? Because we've thought of clusters learning as being very cum a cumulative way, and now I think the literature is moving on to think about combination, combinatorial knowledge dynamics, and that raises a whole new set of issues about participation and individual and collective learning. And the evolution then of the cluster. And the evolution of the cluster, yeah. of course, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I mean, if you just going back to the Silicon Valley, and if you think about, if you if you look at Google as the as an example of an outcome of Silicon Valley, then it bears no bears no relation to where they started 25, 30 years ago when they were competing with the Japanese to produce the same products. So I think you know the, we we have to kind of think, as Laura was saying, around as to. It may not be the solution everywhere, but it may be a solution that's important in some places. And what we're trying to draw attention to is, is that part of the argument. Can I take the group training organisations? Because I don't actually agree that they're wither them. <laughs> I think they're actually flourishing <laughs> to many instances in the UK. And there's a report from Lord Rumbin um, and colleagues the other year ju just on that. Uh, <clears throat> but um, having just listened to um, uh, Lee Weatherby uh, to present at the Institute, who's the uh, <clears throat> chief executive of uh, Midland Training Group, which is a GTA organisation, but they are divert, they're doing exactly, they're living, in a sense, the argument that we're making here, that what they have to do as a group training organisation is to, using the language that Laura had a related variety, think where does their skills relate to a range of industries, so that they move in a more networked way rather than that more concentrated and path dependent way. So group training organisations that are actually going to, that are thriving and prospering, actually do understand the, the dynamics of the economy and how they actually relate to them. Lee told a really interesting story. He said, <clears throat> um, and I think some of my stories are really kind of helpful to kind of get, get a sense of, of, of what these, these ideas might be about. He said, the challenge for my staff is, and this is their CPD, he said, I don't pay for it, they earn it. When they go to companies, they find out what's happening in the locality. They bring back the intelligence. They gather it in and we have debrief meetings. So in a sense, he's doing a lot of what we're describing here. That's what we're saying is the heart of great GTA activity at this point in time. Okay. Um, you're right, a moot point about outcomes and out, uh, outcomes. That's, I, that's fair, okay, <laughs> well spotted. <laughs> okay. um, but, but, um, I'm really sorry, I just want to go back just to prove that we didn't mean to exclude, it says colleges. Okay, <laughs> we didn't exclude FE. We really had FE, uh, you know, the lo everything locally in mind. All right, but sorry, because I wanted to make that point, I kind of forgot the, the question that came up, which is my repeat. It was around how we prepare our students. Yes, the preparation for yes. that collective learning yeah. and that, you know, self, you know, what Manuel Castells talk about the need to be self-programmable learners in in the world of rapid skills, obsolescence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and it's a real challenge for us in terms of the curriculum uh, that we offer our students. So it is. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to refer to another piece of work that I'm, I'm currently doing, about, which is actually in further education colleges, which has got a sort of a set science, engineering, technology angle. And from going and doing the field visits, what we've actually seen is quite diverse practices that are going on in colleges to support collective learning between employers, um, you know, learners and, and, and staff. And They've taken that as axiomatic. That's what they have to do. They therefore, I'm sure your college is doing exactly the same. They're trying, you're, what people are trying to say is that actually it, we have to try to create a, pe a, pe a vocational pedagogic practice that is actually generative in the sense that it actually allows people to develop the skills that they may need to, to acquire the, the qualification or the award they're studying for. And often that involves <coughs> customising the award. And one of the issues that we put in the report, which we haven't yet put, have published, but we've kind of presented the discussion, is the distinction between customization and contextualization. That the customization is actually saying with, with the employer, <coughs> what do you need with, from within this area? So let's pretend it's kind of digital skills, you know, but there needs a particular aspect of specialization. How do you build that into the, into the, uh, the, the design of the curriculum? 
<coughs> but so therefore there's the discussion with the employer and it's also the discussion with, with the college staff. And in a sense it takes us into the kind of the territory of the post capital report of dual professional activity. Mm. Okay. Very important and very central. But then the next step, which is very much also furthering the dual professional activity, is how do you contextualise the award so that actually it relates to both the content, what we, I refer to earlier as the disciplinary part, but also the work practice part. Now, of course, apprenticeship, as colleagues acknowledged earlier, is always the best way to do this because the, the learners are moving between the workplace and the college environment or the provider environment. It's much harder, more challenging, if somebody's on a more general vocational programme. So I think it's really important to, um, to, to sort of think about the, the, the fact that if they are different, they do need different kind of approaches to the collective learning. One is collective learning um, probably within the college yeah. environment. The other one is the collective, it prepares something to at least work in that kind of way afterwards. And that's why I kind of slipped in that vocational example from, from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Because what they learned, the, 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 the vocational college in the Netherlands, was that if they were to try to train their students who, who were laboratory technicians by only giving them individualised tasks in the laboratory in the college. And when they went to the workplace, they were working collectively from the moment they stepped in. Then there was a mismatch between the pedagogic approaches in one context and the next. Now, it doesn't mean to say you abandon individual teaching, as many of you in this room who have got an educational background know, but it's about the articulation between the two kinds of approaches. But I would actually make the same argument in a company the training schemes may have to sometimes be focused on the individual. It's how the work practices are organised to actually get the articulation between the individual skills and the actual patterns of work you actually want within the company. And there's a kind of clustering argument of a sort that's, that's underpinning, underpinning that kind of process of development. I mean, building on some of that, if I could sort of take the liberty of asking a question as well on the back of it, in terms of particularly some of your evaluation you've made of the current skill system in the UK. Um, and clearly we're going through a lot of reforms, so that does then raise the question of when you're making certain assertions, which mm -hmm. bits of, <laughs> which oh, yeah. initiatives are you commenting on? But you know, a big element of the debate recently has been, which was drawn attention to by the OECD study, Skills Beyond Schools, is that we've, we've seemed to have lost the diversity in our skills system between um, op options that combine for people the opportunity to work and train at the same time and some of the apprenticeship reforms have been certainly moving in that direction so that people when in future when they secure apprenticeship you know it's important they have a job and then the training is built around the job and I think that sort of unpacks this whole notion about you know it is broader than just a you know an, out, an output um, because it, it is you know part of you know it's built in to what people are doing and yeah. To what extent have you taken into account those kind of dimensions or...? Well, you have, we have in the latter part of the argument, but where it started from, you have to look at a pattern of history. If you take 10 years, if you went from, say, the 10-year period to 2012, 2002 to 2012, okay, <coughs> that's the kind of period that the OECD report is referring to as well. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of stasis in the system where you just described mm -hmm. Leslie. So we're only talking about little shoots in a more recent period. But I kind of think it's about <coughs> that they themselves may still be insufficient. You know, because that's what we're trying to pull out with the, with the typology of the two notions of learning and the different kinds of ways that people are positioned to engage. But it's actually, um, it's not to criticise, but it's to, as I kept on stressing, it's about to say how they articulate more effectively together. But I don't want you to give, give you the impression that this is only true for people who are employed uh, and go involved with vocational qualifications. Having done a study on internship a couple of years ago, uh, an internship as I define it is where it was actually to support skill formation as opposed to the kind of unskilled work experience kind of exploitative kind of stuff that you read about in the press. And these are U big UK companies often advertising these schemes. They were designed for graduates to help them deal with exactly the same issue that we're talking about today about vet learners. Yeah. There's no difference at the level. The issue is actually how do you get the articulation between the individual and the collective built into the learning process. Okay. Um, Mark, I've got some um, strategy here. Two comments or questions. One is, um, is the notion of communities of practice a useful way of trying to link up these two issues, almost taking one as being predominantly an occupational uh, context and applying it to uh, the industrial, if you know, 
well, you mentioned Manchester um, and tying this down to let practice. Uh, there was some work done a few years ago by led by Manchester Met looking at uh, small business development. Uh, and one of the conclusions from that seemed to be that um, initiatives like investors in people or business development uh, initiatives and so forth, it didn't really matter what the is initiative was if a company took it up and it created space then for a focus and dialogue within that business and it is that potentially a left role of creating uh, a learning space not necessarily within the business now but outside and it doesn't really matter necessarily what you label it as and what it focuses on as long as it's got that engagement and it creates that space right would you like to think about the economic job people bit and ask yeah. them to come to the community? On the community practice. Well, I'm thinking, I've, is there I've, any yeah. questions? I, I, I just want to, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. Does anyone want to take up the challenge about defending or promoting Manchester or being able to go to another area? We've got um, Hampshire down the front. <laughs> uh, no? Uh, uh, to yeah. Okay. Do you want to come back then on, um, on that question? Yeah, with the community to practice thing, that's a really, it's a really interesting point. And this idea of participatory learning in clusters seems to be precisely that, that individuals become uh, kind of inculcated into a community of practice around a particular kind of business activity or technology and, and so on and so forth. Um, economic geographers and people writing about clusters, I think, have taken up that idea. But I think the key point about the idea of community of practice is it's about a reproduction of existing practices and not so much about creating new practices, or about how practices link together. And I think even, um, mm. strange your area here, David, but even in, no, 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 really in the uh, kind of organisational learning literature, mm. we're really, people theoretically really struggling to understand how practices connect together. And that, of course, is the challenge if you then want to um, diversify what you're doing, change what you're doing. And we don't, I don't think we really understand very well how that happens. No. Not sure. I mean, just to show you how the kind of academic literature is kind of struggling with that, they kind of turned the community of practice around and talked about the practices of the community to try to show that you actually need to get communities to interact with one another, not as Laura's just said, remain within the community. So, but I still think it's a starting point. I'm not suggesting it's not a starting point. The, the question about the, uh, <coughs> um, the, the, the I, I always favour. Okay, the more open-ended kind of suggestions of the one that you just put to me. So I'm going to play back. I think I think it is an issue. I don't think it does matter sometimes what you label it. I mean, it's a question of what's what is what is it you're trying to do as the goal? What's the purpose? And what I was trying to say at the end, even if we've made uh, in places a kind of a provocative um, a sort of argument, I tried to ground it and say, well, actually, but this could be tested. There's not a lot of expense to the test. Okay, that was what that was the gist of the argument. So if you think that this is exciting, you think this is troubling, but why don't we take a closer look? I'm not arguing for, a, nor is Laura, for a pilot with loads and loads of money. What we're saying is look for conditions where arguably <coughs> uh, that open approach to how do we create learning, but learning around the goal of ultimately innovating to create new, new products and services and therefore new jobs. I think that's, that for me is the, the nub of the... The issue. So yeah, I, I, I would. I would. I don't think what it matters what let's call it. I think it's a question of how they do that kind of work. I was just building on that in terms of communities of practice. If there are certain communities you prioritise, for example, <coughs> management communities, you know, HR professionals, and you know, there's things that, and maybe that's where you were coming at, Nigel, with the IIP dimension. I don't know. I mean, is there, is there more that? Can happen. I don't. Well, like I wouldn't start with the HR community. Not that I'm opposed to HR, mm -hmm. because I actually they think they manage the best of talent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. But <laughs> they absolutely do. But but the the idea for the the new business idea doesn't tend to come from HR. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> having once had a, a, a period of time in BT, um, the, the the salutary reminder was always talking to the frontline parts of BT. It didn't matter where where it was, and they kept on saying, you know. We get generate the ideas, okay? HR support the idea generation. And I think there's, there's a role there, but so I don't think we would, I would want, we wouldn't want to turn to HR to kind of have, initiate discussions personally. Mm -hmm. I'd go with actually, it's, it's the entrepreneurs, it's the people who actually want to kind of think about new directions 
that the, the folk group need to be pulled together there's, if possible. There's one thing building on that I, I wanted to ask, actually, if I may, just even if it's kind of quick reflection, but you know, given the sort of industrial nature of some of these clusters, I wondered what your thought was on industrial policy as another kind of lever to have an influence here and maybe also unlock some of that kind of entrepreneurial aspect of, of sectors and how they're moving forward. So in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> It's a tricky question. Just say it has no role whatsoever. <laughs> well, it depends how you want to think about industrial policy. Um, whether you want to see it as actually enabling, or whether you want to see it as kind of, in a sense, determining. And I suppose I put myself in the former rather than the latter mode. But having done so, and I think that's, that underpins what Laura and I have said throughout. Yeah. But, um, but, but, you raised it, a moment ago, very interesting, the question of, is there a prioritisation? Now, I would have thought, having looked at some of the publications that come from um, you know, your working futures, that you know, you, within your industries, you, you can must be able to see, as colleagues from UKCS, yes, where prioritisations are, as it may or may not lie. So in a sense, there may be some prioritisation. Now, is that an enabling policy? Or is that, you know, the, the, there's an interesting debate to be had, Leslie, I think. Okay. I think we come back to that. Well, that's perfect, because I always like to end an event like this with further questions, so you have to have another event. <laughs> it's like research, and good research report always has to end with loads of questions to do further research. So on that note, that seems a perfect way to end, and if we can just thank David and Laura and the traditional... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have another date for another masterclass, which is... 23rd. 23rd of April, so put that in your diaries um, as soon as you come back from your Easter break. I um, uh, hope we'll see you again. hope you've had this um, kind of valuable time today. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.